Welcome to the first of two listening sessions for the planned Community Electric Vehicle or EV charging grant. I'm Jessica Wilcox, supervisor of the Mobile Sources section here at the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services or NHDES. And with me today are my colleagues, Vanessa Partington, Grants Program Coordinator, and Becky Oler, who is our Bureau Administrator. The purpose of today's listening session is to provide an informal opportunity for all interested parties to share their ideas and desires around funding electric vehicle charging stations in New Hampshire communities. We do not have a specific funding opportunity at this time, as we're still awaiting word from the federal government who we applied to for funding to develop this program. So at this time, we are just seeking your ideas and your input for consideration. Right now, as attendees are entering the waiting room, all of, all of our attendees are muted with no video feed, and you should be able to see and hear DES staff. Online attendees will remain in this state until we open the floor for input. If at any time during this meeting you encounter technical issues, please indicate that in the chat or email ms-grants at des.nh.gov, which is being monitored by a team member. So first you're going to hear from us. We will begin by providing a level setting overview of electric vehicles and EV charging. We will provide some context about relevant DES charging programs, including this one. Then we want to hear from you. We have a series of guiding questions and we'll be asking for you to respond using polls that we will launch, provide written comments in the chat, and raise your hand if you wish to provide oral comment. We'll provide some ground rules for that engagement when we get to it later on in this program. And as time allows, we will also share a sampling of responses that we were that we received through a pre-submitted comments form. At the end, we will provide next steps. Around the one hour mark, we're going to try to, as, as appropriate, break for a 10 minute uh, break in the conversation. So let's get on the same page about electric vehicles and EV charging. We'll start with electric vehicles or EVs as we call them. There are three types of electric vehicles. Battery electric vehicles or BEVs are powered solely by an electric battery. They are sometimes referred to as all electric. Plug-in plug hybrid electric vehicles or PHEVs are powered by a combination of electricity and a gas engine. There are also hybrid electric vehicles which do not plug into charge. Since since hybrid electric vehicles do not plug into charge, the program that we're focusing on today will serve drivers of the BEVs and the PHEVs. So EVs offer numerous benefits. Environmental benefits include reduced emissions of nitrogen oxides or NOx, which contribute to smog formation and acid rain, as well as greenhouse gases and other pollutants. And this is particularly important since transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in our state. EVs are much quieter than gasoline powered vehicles, thereby reducing noise pollution. EVs are also a key strategy for integrating renewable fuel sources into transportation. On the consumer benefit side, EVs are fun to drive, they can be cheaper to fuel and maintain, and they offer the convenience of charging overnight at home rather than having to go to the gas station for frequent fuel ups. You can see by the chart here that the cost of charging a 2023 Ford F-150 Lightning is about half the cost of fueling its gasoline car counterpart, meaning that even with the higher up, up uh, the potentially higher upfront cost, it can cost less per year and less per mile to go electric. Now, when we compare gasoline vehicles to electric vehicles, we see a steep difference in the amount of life cycle emissions. This includes everything from mining the raw materials to manufacturing the vehicles to their energy or fuel usage on the road over their lifetime operation. This study assumed a vehicle lifetime of about 178,000 miles per vehicle and factored in an average U.S. grid mix for the EVs. Now, while gasoline vehicles of today produce on average 429 grams of CO2 per mile, EVs produce 203 to 254 grams of CO2 per mile and are projected to get as low as 147 grams per mile by 2035. Battery electric vehicles, or BEVs, are pure electric. They're powered only by one or more electric motors. Now, they can only go as far as their battery charge will allow them, which is why charging stations are so important. Plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, or PHEVs, have both a battery and a gas engine, 
This battery is small, but it can still be charged. When the battery range runs out, the gas engine seamlessly kicks in. This electricity is usually cheaper than gas. Being able to charge a PHEV's small battery frequently can thereby greatly reduce the consumption of gas and increase fuel efficiency. There are so many EVs to choose from. The market is growing fast, and we're already seeing 60 plus different models of EVs available with more on the way. Automakers are announcing investments into electrification constantly and debuting new EV models. And while we won't be talking about this much today, the same is happening with heavy duty vehicles and fleet vehicles as well. Electric versions of buses, street sweepers, refuse trucks, and multiple different truck bodies are hitting the streets. In New Hampshire, we have over 9,700 registered electric vehicles. You can see by this chart that the number of EVs in each county has been steadily rising since 2016. As time goes on, we expect to see an even more dramatic curve. Now, New Hampshire is projected to see over 140,000 EVs on our roads with over 2 million around New England in the next 10 years. So now let's consider how do we charge all of these EVs? Let's talk about electric vehicle supply equipment or EVSE. Now, whenever we say EVSE, we're referring to EV charging stations as well as the equipment and the infrastructure involved in supporting that charging. So there are three distinct types of EV charging. The first is level one charging, which uses a standard three-pronged outlet. Now, most EV drivers use level one charging at home, in their driveway, or their garage. Level one charging can deliver two to five miles of range per hour of charging, which could be all that you need if, say, you come home after work and plug in and recharge overnight. Next is level two charging. Level two charging can be done at home, at work, or in public places. It requires a 240 volt outlet and a dedicated 40 amp circuit, similar to those large circular plugs that you may have seen for a stove or a clothes dryer. These chargers can deliver 15 to 25 miles of range per hour of charge, making them ideal for locations where you, where you tend to spend a lot of time. If installed at, say, your workplace, it could even help offset the range of your commute. It could also be a good place for where a customer might spend a few hours, like a movie theater or shopping center. Now, some plug-in hybrids and some older battery electric vehicles can only charge on level one or level two, so having these can be very important for those drivers. The final type is direct current fast charging, or DCFC. You may have heard these called level three, but the distinction is that while level one and level two use alternating current, DCFC uses direct current to fast charge a vehicle. DCFC can deliver 80% of a full charge in 20 minutes, or 60 to 180 miles of range per hour, though this depends entirely on the type of charger and the EV's battery. DC fast charging requires three-phase power and its own equipment pad. It's great for fast charging vehicles traveling long distances and for drivers who can't slow charge on level one or level two, such as drivers without private parking spaces at home. It can also be good for drivers who need to supplement their level one charging at home. Now let's dig in a little deeper into these fast chargers. There are three types of charging plugs that you can expect at a fast charger. Think of this like the different types of cell phone charging connectors. The three different charging plug types are CCS, which is the combined charging system, also known as CCS1, which is the standard charging plug for most EVs in the US today. CHAdeMO, which works for a few older electric vehicles and for certain models of Nissan Leaf, and then the Tesla charger, which only works for Tesla vehicles for now. However, several vehicle manufacturers, including Ford, GM, Rivian, Volvo, and Nissan, have announced that they are adopting Tesla's charging plug, which is called the NAX, or the North American Charging Standard. But for now, their vehicles aren't using NAX. Direct current fast charges are important as they deliver the fastest charge for EV drivers. This can facilitate long distance travel through or within New Hampshire. Fast charging can also provide an alternate to home charging and allows drivers to top off along the way. In New Hampshire, there are 27 universal fast chargers and 40 Tesla chargers. For comparison, in Vermont, there are 43 universal chargers, 61 in Maine, and over 100 in Massachusetts, plus many more in Quebec. This means that EV drivers from out of state may have some trouble driving to New Hampshire for tourism, recreation, or business. 
For level two charging, which is important for destinations where drivers tend to spend more time, including our tourist attractions, commerce centers and workplaces, there are 170 public level twos in New Hampshire. In Vermont and Maine, there are 300 apiece, and in Massachusetts, there are over 2,500. So we have some work to do. Now, installing EVSE is an investment. Level one charging is naturally the least expensive. Many, if not all EVs come with a level one charging plug. So all you would need there is a three prong household outlet. Level two charging can cost several thousand dollars and you have to consider the equipment cost as well as the installation cost. DCFC can cost significantly more than that, ranging into the six digits. In addition, some charging projects may require utility infrastructure upgrades, and these can vary greatly based on the utility, the equipment that already is installed, and the project need. Public level two and fast charging site hosts often also want to include some sort of networking capabilities and point of sale capabilities so that drivers can pay for the charging use and the owners can gather some usage data, which can also at this point add some additional costs as well. All this is to say that installing charging, especially fast charging, can be expensive. So let's talk about some important funding programs. First, NHDES is administering the state's Volkswagen settlement funding. 4.6 million has been dedicated to EVSC and a Volkswagen direct current fast charging EVSC RFP was previously made available. Now when we say RFP, we mean request for proposals. And that's when we say, hey, we have funding for projects, and if you want us to fund a project, please submit a proposal using these guidelines. We're probably going to use the same structure for the next funding opportunity, so it's worth discussing this. So this was a competitive RFP, which was open from September 2021 to February 2022. It was open to any party with the knowledge and expertise necessary to meet the requirements in the RFP. NHDES re received 43 eligible proposals, which represented 35 total sites around 25 towns and cities. We scored all 43 eligible options and selected 14. Some of those projects are in progress as we speak, and we expect that some of those will have charges online and ready for public use by the end of this year, while others may be opening early 2024. Some of the selected projects are still negotiating and finalizing their contracts. As contracts are finalized, we send them to the New Hampshire Governor and Council for review and approval. If they do approve these contracts, we expect that we'd see these projects complete and their charges online sometime late in 2024. These sites would all be publicly available 24 seven, utilize that CCS connector and channel plugs, and most of all, and most of them will also have level two charges on site. This VW program, along with New Hampshire DOT's National EV Infrastructure Program, or NEVI, for which the NHDOT is receiving $17 million in federal funding for, these two programs are targeting corridor sites meant to be near highways to facilitate EV travel on major corridors. Now we can shift gears to the program we're talking about today, the Community EV Charging Grant Program. This program is also through Federal Highway's NEVI funds, but through the Discretionary Charging and Fueling Infrastructure Program, specifically the Community CFI subprogram. So back in June, NHDES applied for this program, and we're hoping that award announcements are made soon. Note, funding is not guaranteed, but we are hopeful. Because this is a community-focused program, we are not targeting corridor locations. We're not excluding them either. We're just not focusing on them like we did with the VW program. Now, the goals for this program are to enable New Hampshire residents to charge EVs and enable travelers to charge at the destinations, encourage EV drivers to drive to walkable downtown areas, enable residents within their own garages or driveways to charge EVs, and to support historically underserved and often overlooked communities. As such, we have some priority location types commerce or culture centers, rural locations, locations near multi-unit dwellings like apartment complexes, tourist attractions, parks and public spaces, and locations near transit hubs like bus or train stations. Now, as a reminder at this time, please do not provide us with suggestions for locations or sites. We know there are some great sites that come to mind when we read these priorities. But our hope is that applicants will work with local leaders to develop project proposals that, holiday, that highlight a site's suitability. 
Now, because this funding is federally sourced, there are some strict minimum requirements and restrictions. Now, while we welcome your input on our program development, we must adhere to these restrictions. For example, all sites must support charging at least four vehicles simultaneously. We could potentially fund more than four ports, but not less. The ports can be all level two, all DC fast charging, or some combination of both. All DC fast chargers must provide each vehicle a minimum of 150 kilowatts. This is a federal minimum requirement, and we cannot allow anything below that, although we could allow higher. Level two has a minimum of six kilowatts and has a caveat about letting drivers opt into accepting a lower rate, likely for a lower cost. Now, all fast chargers must have the CCS1 charging plugs. We can't fund DC fast charging that doesn't have CCS1 plugs. But we, we do have two guiding questions that we're going to go over today, which will ask about other types of charging plugs. So we'll get into that shortly. There are also some technical restrictions, like the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, Buy America, and point of sale restrictions that we will also need to follow. Since this is a listening session and we're here for some input on some decisions to be made, we can't budge, but we can't budge on any of these federal requirements. We're simply not going to really get into them today. If we are awarded funding and we do open an RFP with program guidance, we will host a webinar and provide more guidance. And finally, before we get to the questions and comments, let's look at some of the default structures that we'll be incorporating into this program. Project proposals will be scored competitively. Applicants need to wait for their proposals to be scored, selected, and for a contract to be approved by New Hampshire Governor and Executive Council before they can actually proceed with project work. We'll need status reports throughout the project's lifetime. And yes, applicants are welcome to propose any sites in New Hampshire. We know that from experience that these projects can be large and in intricate, so we expect that projects will have multiple partner entities. That said, only one entity could be the lead entity, and that lead entity is the one ultimately responsible for the project and the one who actually gets reimbursed for costs. Now, we anticipate funding some amount of infrastructure upgrades, but the amount itself is to be determined. And as with all of our grants, funding will be reimbursement only not up front. So now that we have some framework for both EV charging and how our funding programs generally work, let's get into the specific guiding questions. Now the procedure for today's listening session will be as follows. We will ask a guiding question and then launch a poll to collect responses. Your response when you answer the poll will be anonymous. If you would like to comment further, please do so using the chat feature not the Q&A function, as this is a public forum and not everyone has access to that. We want your input and feedback. You are welcome to ask clarifying questions, but we're not planning to answer questions about our program or our priorities in this forum. This program is really still in development. We will notify you when a Q&A document is posted publicly. DES staff will be monitoring the chat and reading certain comments aloud, and we may ask you to come off mute to clarify or explain further. If you have a comment that you want to expound on, please indicate that in your comment in the chat and then use the raise hand function. Now we can't guarantee that everyone will get to speak due to the fact that we have time constraints on today's forum. We have consolidated some written comments that were received in response to our public comment form that was available between September 20th and October 6th. When I say consolidated, I mean that we received so many responses and some of them echoed one another and others were lengthy. So in the interest of time, we have prepared these comments in a way to present what we received and represent that totality. As time allows, after reading the questions and allowing time for your responses and comments, we will share some examples of what we received. Now, if you're placing a comment in the chat, please make sure to include which question you're responding to or mark it as a general comment outside of these guiding questions. If you see something in the chat that you agree with or want to support, please use the emoji feature to just give it a little thumbs up or other reaction so that we can reduce the amount of repetition in the chat, which will just help us sort through all the comments. Please do not suggest individual sites and please keep your comments constructive and respectful. If they are not, I, as the moderator, will give one warning, and then we will mute the individual and move on. Now, NHDES will not necessarily address all comments. 
and not all comments will necessarily inform program development. Our intent is to learn from you. So we have solicited some input from municipalities, charging companies, utility reps, and members of the community at large. We try not to oversend invites and updates, but we felt this was very important and wanted a diverse and informed audience. The image on this slide reflects the responses that we received to the written comment form. Before we go any further, let's find out who's with us today. Now I'm gonna launch a poll and ask that you respond. Please note, as a reminder, your responses will be anonymous. And if you have any trouble with the poll, please feel free to, answer your, to enter your response in the chat. Give me one minute to launch the poll. So I'm seeing responses coming in. I see we have a lot of folks here from state or regional government and local government. Welcome. I know there are a lot of folks out there, so I'm seeing six responses coming in. We'd love to see more. We'll give it a few more minutes here. We've got now some folks from the federal government joining us as well. Welcome. Now I'm going to leave that poll open and like I said, if you're not able to access it for any reason, please do place your comment in the chat. And ultimately what we're asking here is what sector do you best represent? Individual New Hampshire resident, community organization, local government, state or regional government, federal government, energy or environmental consultant or advocate, utility, EV charging company, solar or other service, electric service company, or a private business, is inter business interested in being a site host? And if other, please do clarify in the chat. All righty, as I mentioned, uh, we'll leave that poll open and feel free to also enter in the chat. At this point, it looks like everyone here with us today is from local government. Um, so we welcome that you all to, uh, to this listening session. Hi, Jessica, it's Vanessa. Um, just yes. to let you know, we are getting some errors um, people are receiving on the polls when they try to respond. Okay, that's helpful to know. Thank you. Are they able to, Vanessa, are they able to enter in the chat their responses? Uh, yes, we have some from Local Energy Commission residents, Energy Committee members, Nonprofit Facility Manager. Solar and elect, uh, solar slash other electric service, fueling company, local government, community organization, private business. Excellent. And for those of you that may fall into any of those categories, if there are others, please feel free to use that thumbs up emoji to respond to one of those selections so we know we can count and, and access how many. I'm glad folks are having the ability to access that chat. All right, let's move on into our guided questions portion so that we can hear from all of you. It's the chat, Vanessa is still showing on the screen. Do I need to lower that or can you see my slides clearly? Um, seems to be working. Perfect. So we will now unmute all participants. Please do be sure to remute yourself until and unless you are called upon to speak. If you wish to speak, please use the raise hand icon and wait for one of us to invite you to unmute. Now, as a reminder, Jess, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. So now we're going to move into the guided questions portion so that we can hear from all of you. We've just unmuted all participants, and we ask that you please be sure to remute yourself until and unless you're called upon to speak. If you wish to speak, please use that raise hand icon and wait for one of us to invite you to unmute. 
As a reminder, please be respectful of each other as there are many different different viewpoints represented by the participants of this session. And in all cases, we ask that all particip participants honor the process of being able to hold a public input session to hear different viewpoints and concerns by extending each other courtesy and civility. We will begin inviting public input at this time. I will once again read a guiding question and then launch a poll for you to respond. Note that your responses to the polls will be anonymous. If you would like to expound on your selection or if you're having trouble using the poll function, please type your comment in the chat or your answer in the chat and use that raise hand feature if you'd like to explain further. If we do call on you to speak, please ensure that your microphone is unmuted and begin your comments by stating your name. Okay. Guiding question one, multiple rounds. So we are asking this. NHDES is considering multiple subsequent rounds of this request for proposals and scoring each round individually. For example, if proposals were due December 1st, February 1st, and April 1st, then proposals that were received by December 1st would be scored in that group. Proposals received by February 1st would be scored together, etc. This would allow us to start the contract phase for those projects that came in earlier, earlier, and it would help communities sooner. Although it may mean funds are used up before the final period. What do you think about this method? A, yes, DES should set up multiple submission rounds, allowing DES to potentially start contracting projects earlier. B, no, DES should consider all eligible projects at the end of the request period, allowing all applicants the full period to submit their materials. Or C, other. Let me launch that poll. And like I said, if you're having any issues with it, please do use the chat function to respond. All right, so at this point, we've got a few responses coming in. 50-50 at this point for A and B. We'll let that chat remain open. And certainly, please do feel free to clarify on your selection if you selected A, yes, or B, no. Um, as I mentioned, please put question one in the chat, your, your um, selection, whether A, B, or C, and then whatever clarification you'd like to provide. Hey, Jess, the, uh, yes, the poll screen is not showing. The, the results of the polls are not showing. Yeah, we. so just to clarify, the results of the poll won't be available necessarily to you unless you have you are able to go in and view them yourself or in the chat function. But what we are planning on doing is capturing all this information and posting a document on our CFI webpage, which we're planning to launch in a couple of weeks. So if you aren't able to see the results today, I'm going to try to share them verbally, but we'll also be posting those for folks to see. We've got about seven responses in so far, with the majority being for B. No, NHDS should, should consider all eligible projects at the end of the request period, allowing all applicants the full period to submit their materials. Vanessa, is there any um, any comments in the chat that expound on either of these responses or or have folks chosen other? Looks like we have a lot of votes in the chat actually for A and some for B as well. That's great. Would anyone like to um, raise their hand and expound further? Sharon Stout is raising her hand. Go ahead, Sharon. Thank you. Um, can you hear me OK? We yes. can. Thank you, Sharon. Good. Yeah, so my question. So I'm from Keene. Um, I noticed we have a small, smaller group of EVs or PHEVs or hybrids or whatever. Um, but I was wondering, are you planning to um, award um, the grants to throughout the state or only to your pri um, based on your priorities? In other words, like four for Cheshire, 10 for whatever, like the White Mountains or something, because that's a top tourist spot. That's an interesting question, and, and as I've mentioned, we haven't gotten to the point where we've laid out 
specific um, requirements because we are still waiting word of getting this funding. So this is just kind of giving us food. What we're looking for today is food for thought for us to be thinking, how do we craft a funding opportunity that's accessible to folks? So if you could clarify a little bit further on, on are you saying, are you asking if we would be structuring or, or designating a certain amount of funding to each of the regions in the state? Correct. Okay. That's it's interesting. Like I said, we haven't gotten to a point where we've made any decisions on that. Um, okay. What would be your, I guess, what would be your thoughts on, on designating specific amounts of funding throughout the state? Would you see these as equal portions of funding or how would you, how would you envision that? That's a good question. Um, I, I think it would be based probably, this would be my guess, um, on location. Um, like we're very close tri-state, so it makes sense, I think, for us to have some. Um, but um, also, um, you know, where uh, they're, you know, where are we trying to make um, electric vehicles more accessible to folks like underserved communities or that could be another way of looking at it. So that was yeah, that's kind of what I was wondering is like, was it going to be just like based on, you know, in other words, what criteria would you use um, to uh, try to make sure there's um, stations accessible throughout our state? Because as you know, <laughs> the northern country and the southwest <laughs> areas, um, unfortunately, we tend to get a little bit left out. So um, I was just curious how that how that might work. Well, it's a great question, and, and this funding certainly is, there's a priority of making sure that we engage um, underserved communities, so it's certainly something that we'll be keeping in mind, but as to specifics of how we might approach something like that or, or whether or not we would consider doing that, like I said, those are still up in the air because we have not gotten to a point of making final decisions, so this is good good input. It's It's going to give us some food for thought, and I thank you for that. Thank you. And there's some other input in the chat that agrees um, or echoes what Sharon is saying about equitable distribution of resources. Um, the next person with their hand raised is Mark Byron. Go ahead, Mark. Um, can you hear me now? We can. Okay. I answered A purely as a user. Okay. I, I understand that it takes it probably takes a lot of work for towns and, and cities and people to get this all done, but I want to see more of them because first as a user, I'm lucky I have a Tesla, but as a user, you just want to see more. And if you, if people see more faster, they're more apt to buy an electric car. So you've got to get them out there. I know the, I can understand the concerns of, you know, the individual people who are requesting these funds. I'm sure it takes a lot of work, uh, but I'd like to see them as early as possible. Uh, so, but again, you have to be fair too. You don't, you know, small towns would probably have to struggle to do all these forms. So they, the process might leave them out. So I don't know how you do that, but that's my point. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate that input. And some others are echoing that cement sentiment as well saying if you have a project ready to go you should be able to go so that's some more feedback next we have m fredericks go ahead m hi yes um i think that there's a way to perhaps address both those concerns and by by making a round of funding that is available right away december 1st so that we could get more chargers out into the communities where they are needed but um reserving a portion of that funds based on geographic consideration, particularly because um, although all these great points you brought up included, um, you know, things like traditionally marginalized communities, more rural income, um, but just recognizing that based on the organization of our local government, that are really small towns, um, definitely it's harder for them or takes them more time because they just don't have the staff capacity to put together proposals. And so, something that either um, maybe only a certain amount of funding as someone had suggested 
goes out in each period. So there is a guaranteed funding pool that will be available for the final deadline. Um, or else allocating, you know, looking at the different kind of the population range in our state for towns and then setting aside a percentage, you know, if our towns, 30% of our towns are under 5,000 people, um, then 30% of that, of that um, well, something that's proportionate to population and so that ensures that there's a, a pool available for our smaller towns that may need more time to put together proposals. Thank you very, Thank you much. very much. And next we have Brian Norton. Go ahead, Brian. Good morning, everyone. Um, I represent a private business who's in the tourism industry. Uh, certainly a ton of demand. We see daily people are asking us about more chargers. Um, I chose a, uh, although I think to the last two folks that there's some considerations on the on the back half um, and making sure the entire state's covered here. Uh, my main reason for choosing A is a lot of the electrical infrastructure that's required for these chargers are long lead times, some as long as two years out, and any hesitation we have is just prolonging the inevitable here. And if I need to order a transformer to put in a level one or a level two charger or a bigger panel or whatever it is, um, I could be waiting a year or two for that electrical infrastructure. So the sooner I get some sort of commitment that I can do this, the sooner that electrical infrastructure can get ordered. And um, it, it may still come online well after some of the stuff that's in the later rounds, but you know, you, you got to account for the timing outside of the funding here so we can commit to um, getting the really long lead time stuff. Yes, supply chain delays. We're certainly hearing that across the board. So thank you for that input. And next is Mary or Murray Brunner. Excuse me if I'm mispronouncing that. Go ahead. Actually, you, you got that. Right. Um, my name is Mary Brenner. I'm with the city of Keene, and I um, I just wanted to add to this discussion about the way that funds should be distributed. Like if we do, if, if New Hampshire DES goes with the multiple rounds, I would encourage you to think very carefully about how to not disadvantage smaller, more rural communities or communities that have underserved populations where it's going to take a little bit longer to engage with those communities. You know, if you have an underserved population, chances are they have not been engaged with the local government and you're going to have to do some extra work to do that engagement. Also, as somebody who's um, tried to submit a federal grant before, I, I appreciate that you're doing this. I, I want to say this first off so that hopefully it'll be a little bit less of a lift for local communities than a federal grant. But even so, it is a massive amount of work for a local community. And if a local community doesn't have experience doing that, it's, you know, that extra two months could be crucial. So I would strongly encourage you to do it all as one round or structure the multiple rounds so that you're not disadvantaging those smaller communities. And if you do look at um, maybe, you know, proportioning the funding between the rounds, one thing I'd encourage you to consider is where there's a charging desert, not just the, the demand, um, so that par portions of our state don't get left out. Um, so that's those are my thoughts. Thank you. And that seems that's everyone that had their hand raised. I'm not sure if you want to move on, Jessica. Great. Any additional comments before I move on? This is the three second warning. OK. Oh, we just had someone raise their hand. Uh, Michael F. Go ahead, Michael, and then we'll move on. Yes, I'm, I'm just thinking we might uh, we might learn a little bit from history. Um, when when trains started west, uh, things things along the uh, along the route picked up. People went to those population centers um, based on transportation needs. The same thing was true when the oil industry furthered uh, car transportation. Uh, they put gas stations in places where people were en route. Uh, so it, it it pays for us to look at what the public sector has done in the past and how transportation systems um, were molded uh, for the use of people. Uh, you know, we often hear of 
transportation needs uh, in the North Country. And that is definitely true. My wife and I recently took a trip um, and we opted to go to Vermont rather than Northern New Hampshire because the, the, because the limited availability of electricity in Northern New Hampshire. Now, had there been infrastructure available in Northern New Hampshire, we might have vacationed far north where they really could use the funds. And uh, we, because we have such a lack of uh, funding in the nor in northern part of the client, uh, of our state, we're we're really cutting off our nose to spite our face sometimes. If we look at look at Vermont, uh, their their infrastructure is every place you can find a charger, any place you go in the state. We are as we are of a similar size, but unfortunately, the way distribution is done right now. Uh, favors the southern tier, and even in even in the southern tier, we don't have enough. There's there's very limited amounts of level three charging. Level twos are fine, but generally speaking, if you're if you're um, if you're interested in going large distances, you're looking for level threes, not level twos. Level twos are nice to have, but that vehicle is going to be sitting there for quite a, quite a length of time. So level threes are really what really what the state could use the most of if we're if we're looking to bring in transportation dollars. So that's a thank you for that input as an EV driver. And so there are some programs right now, such as the Volkswagen program and the, the national EV infrastructure funding that the state DOT is getting that are targeting fast charging on the corridors. Are you seeing a need beyond corridors for fast charging in those communities as well? Yeah, ab absolutely. Because basically, you know, it, it's nice to have we have we have two primary roads in the state, 89 and 93. All right, those are our corridors, and okay, and and we do have 101, of course. But there are but there are a lot of areas in the state that people want to visit, and they can't do so now. And it's and it's primarily above Concord. And and you know if if I were someone from out of state, I wouldn't want to come to the northern part of the New Hampshire because there's no there's no place to plug in. If if I have to if I have to plug in at 110, I'm not going to bother. It's a waste of my time. If to be sitting sitting there for you know for 15 or 20 hours waiting to plug waiting to get charged. But if I but if I ha I know a level two or level three is available, yeah, I'll go to the state, but. I'm not going to I'm not going to bother if you know if, if I want to go to the White Mountains to ski and there's no place to to plug in. Let's go ski in Vermont. Ma makes perfect sense to me. Thank you very much for sharing. OK, uh, we, we will now. Oh, so go ahead. Beth. We've had two other people raise their hands. Not sure if you want to move on to the next question or if you want to take their comments. I think we can take their comments. OK, I, I believe the other one's M again. Um, go ahead, Em. Oh, I just wanted to mention um, that um, there is a New Hampshire RSA that allows towns to charge up to a $5 additional fee um, on car registrations. And we're currently examining whether we could use that to help fund some additional public EV chargers in town. Um, so that would be something. It would be a public benefit. I mean, it, it wouldn't. They wouldn't be free to charge your car. You would pay for whatever you're charging. But it would be a way to build up some funds um, to add our infrastructure. And I think in the first mm. year we could probably do two EV chargers if every car registered in town paid an extra five dollars. So that's something we need to look at more with our town attorney. But that's something we're exploring. Thank you for Thank sharing. You for that. Sharing that. Uh, just as a reminder, please mute your mic again. We're getting some feedback when you come off of speaking. Um, the next person is Cred Fern. I'm sorry, there's no name. It's an email address, credfern at ne.rr.com. Thank you. Yes, this is Chuck Redfern from Keene, and I'm with the uh, a committee that's set up by the City Council for Energy and Climate. And uh, the members are citizens uh, that are interested in energy and climate. 
and um, for our city. So the question I have is we had a manufacturer in Keene, still do, and he wanted plans for putting in uh, uh, a couple additions to his uh, large field he had. And one of the things he wanted to have was um, electric charging stations, both for his employees, but also for the general public. And he was told that he can't charge the general public a fee for using the chargers unless there's a membership that they sign up for. Has anybody heard of that before or is this a true statement? And what can be done to eliminate the membership op uh, requirement? Hmm. I don't know that that's a question we could answer right now. There's some complexities to that. Um, so what I would ask is if you could email um, or type that question in the chat. And what we're going to plan on doing is digging into some of these questions that may have other layers to them and putting together a question and answer response sheet that we'll post on our website um, to, to get to those. Yeah, my question is in the chat already. Perfect. Get my hand. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hey, Jessica, if I may yes. just jump in on that one quickly. <clears throat> Any of the uh, vehicle charging infrastructure we have funded to date uh, does not allow we um, anybody to require a membership in order to be able to use the charger. So, for example, several of the sites that we funded use charge point chargers, but the for anybody can drive up to that charger and use it they don't have to have a membership with charge point and we would all we will definitely continue that going forward with any publicly funded charging infrastructure yes and i i think too it would be helpful to know who who told the site owner that was that coming from um from somebody be whoever's funding that program or to charging company itself. So if you could just expound on that in your in your question, make sure we have your email to respond to you. Uh, sure. Which we, thank you. Again, so I'm C Redfern at ne.rr.com. Oh, perfect. It's in my chat with the thank question. You. And you so also too, um he had indicated that it was the uh I think it was the planning board in the city of Keene that uh, informed him of this restriction. Very good, thank you so much for, for sharing. We'll, we'll look into that for you. All right, so in response to this question, when we posted that public comment form between September 20th and October 6th, we got a majority of votes for setting up multiple submission periods. We also heard some expounding on that. Some folks said, more charges are needed as soon as possible. The need is now. We heard that as well from some folks on this call. Um, folks, of course, re reminding us that getting consensus and planning permissions are going to take some time, that we should look at building the funding opportunity around town budget and town meeting timelines, and that multiple submission periods, staggered grant rounds, rolling out in stages would allow for broader participation, quicker deployment and opportunities to learn from initial difficulties rather than all of the projects hitting simultaneous stumbling blocks. So there could be some lessons learned there. There was also requests to allocate funds equally among the multiple rounds if we went that route so as not to penalize applicants in resource poor communities that might take longer to prepare their proposals. So a lot of what was echoed here today was coming in on that earlier feedback comment form. Now we will transition to guiding question number two and this is regarding the NACs or Tesla. So we are asking, the NEVI standards require that all ports include CCS1 charging plugs, but they do not prohibit the inclusion of other types of charging plugs. So while many vehicle manufacturers have signed on to produce NACs capable vehicles, Tesla chargers throughout the state may already serve these vehicles. Taking all of this into account, which of the following would you recommend? A, that DES requires the NACS plug in addition to the CCS1 plugs. B, that DES can fund NACS plugs in addition to CCS1 plugs, but not require them. 
C, that DES should not fund NAX plugs whatsoever or other. D, I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. And for folks that have been having challenges with the polls, please feel free to select the letter code that, uh, that, uh, that aligns with your response. Put that qu question to put your letter um, in the chat and that way uh, we can we can track those responses as well. So we're seeing some responses coming in for C. DES should not fund NAX plugs as well as B. Can fund but not require. Little 50-50 going on right there right now. Vanessa, how are we looking in the chat? Um, lots of errors on the poll again, Jess. Um, one person, Yasmin, suggested I would say B, but with an extra point awarded to the proposals that can offer both. Um, another person, Ron, stated B, the industry is and will continue to move in this direction, so it makes sense to allow them to be funded. JJ Smith commented D, older Nissan need Chatamo or an adapter. Mm, yes, the polls I'm seeing are two and two at 50-50, so I'm not sure how accessible those are, unfortunately, to people. Good thing we have the chat as yes. backup, right? <laughs> And would anybody like to raise their hand and, and clarify further or add any further comment to this? We've got Mark Byron. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, well, I'm a Tesla user and I purchased a CCS adapter for my car. And I believe what will happen is the that the opposite will be also it'll be also available for any kind of car that has the NAS option. So right now, that's I don't think that's really important. It's more important to get it out. And uh, at some point, if everybody decides to go with the, the NACS plugs, uh, it's mostly uh, a hardware fix. They would just put a new cable in. Um, so it, I mean, it would be an expense, but it, it could be retrofitted at the end. So I would say allow it if people want it, but I, right now I don't think it's that important because the peop, somebody like me, who's mostly Tesla, can access those CCS, though I'm not sure we would do that. It would be mostly, I only use it for an emergency case. I don't, because it's just easy to go over to Tesla. But there are still a few places and that are, are, are not, a Convenient. I wouldn't say available, not convenient for where you go. But. And what are your thoughts, Mark, on the automaker commitments to begin incorporating the NACs into their products? What kind of I impact believe, do you perceive? Yeah, that? I will believe it. it will, the, well, the only concern that um, some manufacturers, this is very technical, uh, concern that some manufacturers had is that the uh, NAS is not 800 volt compliant. Which, um, for technical purposes, that means you could put much more power in. That you could charge a hundred kilowatt hour battery pack in ten minutes rather than twenty minutes. Um, but I don't see that as a an issue. Um, you can always counter that with just more charges. Um, if there's more charges, then this need to really charge really fast is not necessary and it costs a lot of money you know, the current standards of you know 150 250 kilowatts i think is um perfectly fine um but again i'm not the general public there are some use cases you know if you're traveling and you a trucking company something like that but they they'll have an entirely different infrastructure than, than we do, but I don't. I think they're all going to go up because it really has to do with the the cable itself. 
Uh, if you've ever tried to use a CCS cable or Chatterall cable, it's got big, heavy cables. And, you know, I wouldn't say it's incredibly difficult, but it's, it's cumbersome. Where the CCS, where the NAS is much easier to deal with, you can do it with one hand. I could teach an eight-year-old to do it, uh, whereas an eight-year-old may have an issue with a CCS cable. So it's going to go in that direction. It's just, it's just a better plug system. Forget about Tesla or anything else. They they just designed a better plug. That's easy. Also, you don't, you know, you, you don't plug into two. You use the same thing to do level two and level three. This with with the the CCS, you you literally have two different connectors in in there. You have a, a level two connector, and then they add a few more things to make it a level three connector. So it just makes it for a bigger connector, a little bit more complicated. Again, I'm, I'm getting a little bit confusing and going too long, but I don't think it's going to be a problem. I think all, everybody's going to go to that. Uh, there might be some exceptions, but that's going to be minority. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Yes, it looks like two people responded. Um, see that we should not fund the NAX plugs. Um, next, we have Michael F. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, my <clears throat> my thoughts in requiring the um, North American charging standard is that uh, by 2025, uh, most of the major manufacturers that have signed on to that standard uh, plan on implementing those vehicles from 2025 on with uh, not only the adapter for their older cars, but having having a a, a charge compatible vehicle that will take the NACS charge. Uh, so by the time by the time these chargers come online, we're going to be looking at 24 or 25 anyway. It seems to me to make the most sense that we make our chargers future compatible, not backwards compatible. Um, as much as we'd like to see, we'd like to see Nissan with their old style plug it's it's gone by the wayside i'm afraid and they're going to have to uh in order to use those vehicles they're going to have to uh, buy adapters uh, ccs plugs are going to be in that same exact position uh, ccs drivers of which i'm one um, i will have to buy a plug if i keep my car um, so it, it seems to me to make the most sense to make these future compatible because by the time they hit you know, they hit stations, everybody's going to go to NACS anyway. Thank you. Thank you, Michael and Yasmin. Hi. Yeah, um, I actually was going to say very much what Michael just said, which is uh, it's only a matter of time, you know, really a matter of one or two years, and then we are all going to almost all going to be using the NACS um, uh, type of plug and the thing with adapters is they don't always work and so we can always say oh keep them all CCS and you can just buy an NACS adapter but um, I've seen even you know Tesla adapters to CCS don't always work and so it'd be nice to just be able to it, there's already unreliability with chargers adding that into the mix seems like an unnecessary um, obstacle um, so I think including both is probably the right way to go. Thank you. And that's all for now, Jess. Thank you. Great. We are at the top of the hour, and I had mentioned when it seemed appropriate, we would take a 10 minute break. So what I'm going to do is just read some responses to the online comment form that we had, and then we'll transition to that 10 minute break. So real quickly, as you can see on the screen, um, we had an almost even split between A, requiring, and B, could fund but not require, but B got most votes. So some of what was clarified on, on that front was there are enough NACS plugs available now. The majority of unmet need is CCS1. That automaker support is still evolving. That having the most accessibility early in the rollout of the stations will enable a good reputation for the charger program. That DES should require every charging station to support NACS and CCS1 for at least the next five years of funding that we need to build for the future, that the, they're saying the evidence is clear that NACS will be the future standard. 
requiring CCS1 for backwards compatibility for the time being might make sense, but also chargers should include NACs as well. And then giving applicants the flexibility to submit applications given their own unique needs. So we, we kind of heard the gamut and this was great food for thought. Um, what I will say is right now we will transition to our 10 minute break and we will see you back at 110 to continue on with the rest of our guiding questions. Thank you.
OK, it's 1.10 on my clock here, so we will take this opportunity to return to our community charging grant listening session. Question three, guiding question three. We are asking, while the Chatamo charging system has become less common on newly announced EVs, it may still be necessary for legacy EVs and used EVs. Like the previous question about the NACs, which of the following would you recommend? A, that NHDES requires Chatamo plugs in addition to CCS1 plugs. B, NHDES may fund Chatamo plugs in addition to CCS1 plugs, but not require them. C, NHDES should not fund Chatamo plugs whatsoever. Or D, other. And I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. For those of you that are having challenges using the poll system, please feel free to write the question number, the letter number that's your response in the chat, and certainly you could feel free to explain further. And if you're interested in commenting, Please raise your hand and we'll call on, on you. So far, I'm showing a few responses coming in with the majority being for B, DES may fund Chatamo plug, plugs in addition to CCS1, but not require them. We also have a response of we should not fund Chatamo plugs whatsoever. Vanessa, are we seeing anything in the chat? It's mostly what I'm seeing, Jessica. A couple of responses for C as well. Um, one person commented this is not the future as discussed during the, the previous question two's response. Is there anyone raising their hand that would like to comment further or explain or clarify further? I'm not seeing anyone at the moment. We'll give everyone a few more few more seconds here. I know oftentimes when you ask a question, you need to give it a couple of minutes to allow people to formulate a response. OK, and we have JJ Smith. Go ahead, JJ. Hi. Jennifer Smith, um, we own two vehicles with Chatamo, um, and I I think you are kind of ignoring when you say no that the value of our vehicles immediately plummets, um, and the the most recent ones are 2023, and um, I would like to be able to sell vehicles in 2019, 2023 at a reasonable um, price with the supports for used EVs. And you know, most of the um, places in Massachusetts, Vermont, et cetera, there is one Chatamo out of eight. I don't see that that's a, a horrible amount to ask to be put in. Nissan actually sold a lot of LEAF vehicles. It's not like it's not a common vehicle. It is a common vehicle. Thank you. Yeah, as we continue to think about the development of a used electric vehicle market, you know, it's certainly something to consider. Anyone else? We had a couple, uh, excuse me, comments in the chat. One person chose C, um, John. They get adapters. We should not penalize infrastructure with unneed with added unneeded costs. Nancy says B, but if getting supplies is backlogs, why focus on accommodating ones that might be outdated by the time stations are actually built? George says backwards compatibility is important, but equally important is adaptability, perhaps including planning to retrofit these plugs after X amount of years to NACs. Brett states we need to look to other states with more developed infrastructure and build for where the ball is going. That will mean leaving some standards behind to maximize efficacy of the state's infrastructure investment. Uh, Mary agrees with um, Jennifer to the current speaker's point. There are vehicles that take this type of things 
or excuse me, this type of plug and used EVs will hopefully be on the market slash road for many years to come. Thank you for those comments. Anyone else want to add to that and share their their thoughts orally? If not, this is your three second warning. Looks like we're set, Jess. I, I might right. just add that when we're making a determination on any infrastructure investment that we evaluate or consider, like, are we building technical debt? So are we building future conversion efforts? Are people going to use it going forward? I, I can say years ago, I bought an HD DVD player, Blu-ray Blu won that won that format war and yeah, I was unfortunately left behind with that but ultimately that that standard allowed that format to sell a lot more and having having standards matters in terms of in terms of actually getting yield for the money you put into we put into something as a state thank you for that comment and, and your name uh brett brett thank you all right, so let, let's take a look at the comments that came in on that public comment form that we had posted between September 20th and October 6th. So for this question, uh, many of the folks responded that the majority selected B, that we may fund but not require them. What the comments that came in pointed to was many people can't afford to purchase a newer EV, so be mindful of used EVs. Only because there are some legacy Chattamo vehicles out there, you should consider including them. They are saying that they'd also be perfectly fine with excluding those few vehicles from this funding program, so not really committed one way or the other. Some folks said Chattamo is not used by any vehicles and it should be phased out. Used EVs are going to be most accessible to low-income people and who need charging more often, so having these plugs available will be important for equity and keeping cars in service longer. Adapters might be a solution here. We heard a similar comment. One person owns a LEAF with Chatamo and they are aware it's a dying standard in the US. The vehicles have limited range overall. We should have some charges available, but not invest heavily. And then the, lastly, give applicants as much open-ended opportunity as possible to help the applicant make the case for what they're proposing. So all good comments, thank you. All right, let's move on to guiding question four, availability. We are asking, the charging and fueling infrastructure guiding coming down from the federal government for the community program states that chargers must be available at least as frequently as the business hours of the site that they are installed upon. In our VWDC fast charging RFP, which we talked about earlier, we require 24 seven availability and access. NHDES is considering requiring 24 seven availability for chargers funded under this grant as well. What do you think of this? A, New Hampshire DES should require all charges to be open 24 seven. B, charges should be open at, at least as frequently as business hours, but DES should favor projects proposing more availability. C, DES should require DC fast chargers to be open 24 seven, but not level two chargers. And D, or D, DES should require level two chargers to be open 24 seven, but not DC fast chargers or E other. And if you're, I'm going to go ahead and launch that poll. And once again, if you're unable to participate in that poll, please feel free to put the question number, the letter of your response in the chat, and feel free to expound on that. And as I mentioned, if you are interested in speaking, please go ahead and raise your hand and we will call on you. And once again, as a reminder, when you do unmute, please start with your name so we know who we're talking to and then go ahead and move into your comments. Mark. This is hand raised. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I think it could uh, it, the um, you could limit it to certain chargers. So uh, chargers next to the highway, you may want to have 24 hours a day, but chargers that are in towns or cities, uh, you could say as long as this business is open, you should have the charger there. So I, I think that's an alternative, um, but it's definitely important to have 24 hours a day. I mean, there's not a lot of people who do that, but it, for some reason people do that. And also, um, the availability of bathrooms on those networks. Um, so if you could put a charger uh, 
in a place that stays open 24 hours a day. So sometimes I, I've seen a couple of charging stations where they're connected to a convenience store and they're right with the gas station, but the convenience store is open 24 hours a day. So if you're traveling late at night, this is mostly when people are traveling like 11, 12 o'clock, um, when it's not really, really late, you know, the middle of the night, but people are still traveling. So I think it's important, especially on the highways, to have it 24 hours a day. It's not as important if you have a local town where it's inside a town. So that's thank my you, Mark. No, thank you for that. And I know we'd also heard some folks mention to think about folks like nurses who may work, you know, overnight shifts or things of that nature. So there's, you know, there's certainly a lot of thought around who might need to access these chargers during those nighttime hours. Thank you for your comment. Anyone else? With our sentiment person, Yasmin wrote, these are replacing gas stations. We need to make sure people can charge their cars conveniently and at all times or else the switch to EVs will be even more difficult. So um, reflecting that sentiment, um, next person that raised their hand is Levent. Go ahead, Levent. Hi, um, yes, this is uh, Levent Ginchi here. Um, I just wanted to add that uh, I agree with what the, um, the last person who spoke was saying. Um, I think a consideration um, that maybe should be kept in mind is that uh, for municipalities, when you're looking at that community sort of level, um, it could be beneficial to where you're not requiring that 24 access to all chargers, maybe to a portion of the chargers or something like that, but that would allow um, municipal uh, entities to be able to use those chargers for their own switch as well um, to help with fleet vehicles being switched over to electric as well. So having some sort of a balance there, I think, is, is important to consider. Interesting point. Thank you. Thank you. And it looks like we have two comments that um, echo that a little bit. M had stated our public parking lots downtown are closed after 1 a.m. to dissuade drunken and disorderly conduct there when the bars um, get out and the police defend this strongly, but downtown is ideal for a level two charger, which could be open from 6A to 1A. And Brian Norton also commented, some business don't allow overnight parking. If you require 24 hours charger of a level two, businesses may end up with liability concerns for managing their property in the off hours. So M is also raising their hand. Go ahead, M. Go ahead, M, if you had more to add to your comment. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize I was still muted. Um, I was just saying that I think for those reasons that we may lose out on some collaboration and some people who are willing to open up their space to have a charger installed if the requirement is that it's accessible 24 seven because people may say, oh, for my business liability concern, I'm not comfortable with that. Or, you know, it, you may have townsfolk who rally against because of the parking bans or things like that. But ob obviously there is an accessibility concern. So that's why I think B kind of really balances that best because it's not saying, you know, it's going to be a requirement so that if really what works for this town is a spot that's not going to be accessible 24 seven because it's ideally located, um, you know, it will have a wide range of accessibility but it gives points to those projects that have increased accessibility. So a town will know, okay, well, if we can make it 24 seven, we're gonna rank higher. So we should be aiming for that. But if it really doesn't make sense because we can't make it work for that location, it doesn't mean that we're just going to give up on this project. Thank you. Thank you. There's some agreement um with that in the chat as well matching charges with business hours would be fair hospitals park and rides and 24-hour gas stations would be great for 24-hour locations uh page noted there um john l stated the two issues to consider here first we need to recognize some towns durham for instance have nighttime parking bans second 24 7 charging is necessary for them 
I think this you, makes it. A, I think I lost the part of what you said, Vanessa. Can you just clarify that last sentence? Um, he said two issues to address. First, we need to recognize some towns have parking bans at night. Second, 24 hour, um, 24 seven charges is necessary for those who do not have park private parking, making it a question of accessibility. So all good feedback. And that's um, no one else has their hand raised at this time. Great. We will move on to the types of responses that we received through that public comment form that we had open from September 20th to October 6th. So the majority of those responses selected A, actually requiring charges to be open 24 seven. Um, some of the feedback that we got were off grid solar power provides daytime charging only and any level two site requiring 24 seven coverage should include funding for external batteries. We're never going to get full EV acceptance until more charges are available at all hours of the day. As an EV owner for 10 years, the charger availability is becoming a huge problem as more, as more EVs hit the road. Accessibility is paramount for EV users. Simplicity, most charges are not going to require on-site management. Comments about some workers starting early or finishing late. Others work shifts, some people travel overnight. Some comments said 24 seven could open the charges up to potential security issues. Cameras could be a solution. And that DC ch fast charges are frequently used during longer trips and by out of state visitors and should be available 24 seven to accommodate. They are the destination themselves, so to speak. By contrast, level two chargers are, with the exceptions of ones located at a hotel or overnight destination, they're nice to haves at a destination for the EV drive that the EV driver is visiting. Therefore, the level two charger is mostly going to see demand when the business or attraction it is attached to is being visited. And some places don't allow overnight parking, so we need to consider parking ban, winter parking bans. So we'll definitely have a lot of food for thought here and a lot of things to consider. And thank you all for your input. All right, let's move on to guiding question number five. This is on infrastructure. This is what we're asking. While chargers can be expensive, the cost of infrastructure upgrades and other site work, sometimes called make ready costs, can cost even more. Some sites may need more upgrades than others. DES could fund some degree of these costs, but the expense of the total number of projects funded, right? So how do you believe DES should balance those two priorities? A, DES should maximize funding of make ready costs, even if this means minimizing the number of projects that get funded. B, DES should fund much of the make ready cost, even that means reducing the number of projects selected. C, DES should fund some of the make ready cost, ensuring more projects can be funded. D, DES should fund minimal make ready costs, ensuring the number, the maximum number of projects are funded. Or E, other, and please clarify in the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and launch the poll. For those of you that are, are not able to use the poll, please put the question number and your letter selection in the chat. Feel free to also, for anybody responding, to put those comments in the chat and raise your hand if you'd like to clarify further. So far, I'm seeing three results and the selections of B, C, and D, each person selecting one of those. Vanessa, are we starting to see anything in the chat? Yes, we have a few responses. Um, in question responses all over the board, really. One comment, um, they chose A, although I would add to this that NHDES should also prioritize funding battery storage when possible. Tom chose B, especially in rural communities. This kind of stuff is a major burden. Sharon chose E, what about, or, or stated E, what about funds for old charges that needed updating? Interesting question. Um, we have C, A, B, B, C, um, and M, gave feedback DES should prioritize equity for underserved and low income communities if that means more make ready costs then fine. We also have Brian Norton with his hand raised. Go ahead, Brian. I um 
again, Brian Norton uh, representing the tourist attraction in the White Mountains here. Uh, the electrical infrastructure cost for some of these chargers is, as you pointed out, higher than the chargers themselves. In most cases, what we're spending to install chargers this summer is almost double in terms of the electrical infrastructure. We're a little unique in that sense because we own all the transformers and stuff. Um, but the, the 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 pipe, the excavation, the electrical work, I think all of that should be part of this funding project. I do not think the niceties, the line painting, the paving, the access, what I'd be fearful of is someone abusing the funds to get a nice new parking lot or a new um, right of way through a neighbor's property or whatever it is that aren't necessarily required to have the electrical charging. I think the you know what the state should be funding here is electricity and what it takes to get there not the other stuff um you know the businesses particularly have to have some ownership in these things and you know not everyone is as fortunate or has as much much funding behind them but i just be real i the state should be funding whatever they can to get this going but be very careful that people aren't taking advantage of it and uh you got to draw a line somewhere thank you go ahead yasmin Hi, uh, I don't think I introduced myself before. Uh, Yasmin Tayebi, uh, Operations Manager at Champlain Energy Systems. And um, yeah, I, I want to echo what the last speaker said, that a lot of this infrastructure costs, I agree, the painting and all that is one thing. But when we're talking about upgrading the service, um, you know, bringing it up to code to handle 600 kilowatts is incredibly expensive in some places. And even though... We, we've seen this in a different state where they actually prioritized, um, you know, technology like battery energy storage. So even though the upfront cost of the product might be more expensive than a traditional DCFC, when you take into account what someone might have to pay for those infrastructure costs, it actually ends up being either the same or even cheaper to put the battery on site. And then that does two things. It helps the grid, obviously, the resiliency. And then on top of that, the owner and operator has much lower costs at the end of the day because of the demand charge um, reduction. So I would I would hope that New Hampshire and other states look favorably on products that may be more expensive up front, but do save these types of headaches and costs down the road. Thank you. Thanks, Yasmin. Uh, we have Bill Baber. Go ahead, Bill. <clears throat> Sorry, a little trouble unmuting. Um, I think maybe a more nuanced approach building on what the prior speakers uh, just mentioned would be a good a good way to proceed where the DC fast chargers um, that were on major transportation corridors that don't currently have service, that they would be prioritized and give um, you know full funding for make ready, um, but not for um, DC fast charger installations that um, you know, are um, not on a major corridor because it's, uh, as said, the infrastructure costs for those is uh, quite large, but you serve uh, a much larger body of users if you're hitting major transportation corridors. Thank you, Bill. We have uh, uh, some comments in the chat. Nora stated applications should incorporate some indication of make ready costs so that projects that represent needed demographics and higher make ready costs get some of these extra costs covered and more redundant type project applications may not get make ready costs supported. John stated utilities should be encouraged to provide makery. Batteries should be included in some otherwise C for low income. Do we want to Get some clarification on that one. I, I don't know if I was clear on what. John, that... did you want to comment on that? I don't have a last name. Apologies. Yeah, I mean, the, the utilities should be encouraged to make ready. That's the way the world should operate. But with the current environment at the PUC, highly unlikely. So therefore, Batteries should be encouraged in the absence of that. And finally, um, low income, moderate income should be encouraged communities that that really would benefit the most from this from either the tourism or other aspects. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying. 
John Lanneman stated one way to minimize infrastructure is to maximize use of slower charges at long term parking lots. He goes on with some specifications and an example of that. And we have Mark Byron raising his hand. Go ahead, Mark. Um, I'm not sure, but I heard that the federal government uh, now has some money available for fixing and maintaining older level two chargers. So I'm not sure if you're aware of that. I'm, I'm assuming you are, but to the other people, if you have an old charger, I would use that money first before using this money. Thank you, Mark. And I think what you're referring to is there was a portion of this overarching federal funding that that the federal highways refer to as the 10% set aside funding. And they recently did open a funding opportunity and it's very specific charging stations that they've identified. There's links to that. If anybody's interested in this in this funding opportunity, please um, feel free to email ms-grants at des.nh.gov and, and put in your email, want more information on the 10% set aside. And what I could tell you is that they've identified specific charging stations in that fall under eligibility for that funding. There is a lot of funding available to upgrade those sites, but one thing to know is that those sites, which may have currently only one level two charging station that maybe is just not operating, if they were to go after this funding, they would have to, to upgrade those sites to meet those NEVI standards, such as now they would have to have four ports available at that site. So there's gonna be certain restrictions on that um, for any applicant applying for that funding, but thank you for, for bringing that up, Mark. And it looks like Michael Dennehy actually put that link in the chat for us. So thank you, Michael, for that. Um, we have feedback from George Anderson. I believe a transparent decision matrix needs to be utilized by NHDES when making these decisions regarding funding and make ready costs. This should take into account opportunities for projects with lower make ready costs, but also take into account projects that serve underserved communities. For example, prioritizing projects in underserved communities with lower make ready costs and so on. Thank you. Um, and we also have Sharon Stout with her hand raised. Go ahead, Sharon. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, OK, um, this is a separate question for my comment. Um, what do Vermont and Massachusetts do um, with their funding? And would that be something we could look at to look at our funding? That's an interesting question. And so just to just to clarify, this is funding that has not yet been awarded this this bucket of funding yep. that we've applied to for this particular community EV charging grant. And so I believe no, I believe anybody that's applied and I don't know for specifically if those states did apply for that funding because it wasn't a requirement that states apply. In fact, even local governments could apply, um, but it's certainly something we keep in mind. Um, at DES, we do have a lot of engagement within at, with other state agencies within the region. We're always listening for, um, you know, what have other states done and, and keeping that in, in consideration as we're developing our own state specific opportunities. But I don't believe anybody's um, at the point of, of developing a funding opportunity because awards have not yet been announced, but certainly um, appreciate that that spotlight and something to keep in mind. Yeah, Thank so you. that's uh, my next question. So um, uh, what I heard from the group is that installation is far more than the chargers. So is it what, 60 to 40 percent? I mean, what are we what are we looking at here? I don't know that we would have be able to provide a specific percentage because each site is so unique. Some of these mm -hmm. sites uh, may already have existing electrical supply at the site and won't need those types of upgrades. Um, maybe other than to trench or to put in conduit if it's not already there, but other sites may require more. So it really is site specific um, when it comes to the make ready. But thank you for your question. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And Paige in the chat asked, does the Justice 40 initiative play a role in this? Census tracts may be a way to decide a percentage of make ready expenses to be funded. That is a, that's a good, 
good question page and a good point. And so, yes, um, all of this federal funding um, does prioritize, as I mentioned, underserved communities. Um, so that's that's an interesting point to consider. Thank you. And uh, no one has their hand raised at this time. Very good. So let's hear from the written comment form, how folks responded to that. So when we had this comment form open, we actually saw the majority of folks selecting C, um, which was NHDS should fund some of the make ready costs, ensuring that more projects can be funded. What we heard is we're behind in infrastructure and need whatever it takes to get it in place. A two tiered approach could be applied. No coverage of make ready costs for level two EV chargers that can be installed and scaled up quickly with make ready cost coverage reserved for level three, the, the DC fast EV chargers that take longer to deploy and face costlier future upgrades. Selected sites should be chosen for available utility and cost effectiveness, not pay to bring utilities to a non-developed site. Setting some make ready cost ceilings or limits will ensure this program funds destination downtown sites with existing power supplies. On one hand, the make ready costs are a heavier burden in small rural resource poor communities. On the other, having more charging stations is critical for rural residents to be able to access the benefits of EV ownership. The state should decide how much to cover on a case by case basis with more money being reserved for more rural and lower income areas and for lower income businesses. And covering make ready will increase the likelihood that applicants will invest in DC fast charging. So a lot of food for thought. Now we're going to transition to the general input portion of our listening session, and this is open to any input that that you have on on your thoughts. What we're asking is, do you have any or feedback or input that you'd like to add? Is there something we didn't cover? Did you hear something in the results of the online public comment form that you'd like to expound on or that changed your thinking or that triggered additional thoughts? Um, there is no poll here. We are just looking for you to respond in the chat and raise your, your hand and we're opening it up to any and all comments at this point. So first question in the chat, Yasmin asks, does NHDES have a goal for how many sites they would like to fund in this in this first um, round? Again, Yasmin, the funding is not available yet, um, but do we have a goal, Jessica? Yes, and so because we are just looking for input to inform the development of a funding opportunity, we are not at a point where we've established any minimum number of chargers that we're looking to get to get in place. We just want to make sure that we make this accessible statewide to New Hampshire businesses and communities, and um, we have not put any parameters on a specific number of charging stations that we're anticipating seeing as a result of that. And there's just so many variables that come into play as well in terms of whether or not the proposal will be for the DC fast charging stations, which can be more expensive or for level two, or you know, with supply chain delays and inflation, those impacts might also impact pricing. So um, it would be hard, I think, to even set a goal just because there's a lot of variables in play. Jessica, I'd also note we don't know yet how much money we might get. <laughs> Good point. Good we point. asked for a lot. <laughs> we don't know what we'll get. Thank you, Becky. That's a good point. We did ask for um, $10 million, but there's no guarantee we would get all of that, right? Or any of it. So fingers crossed. So one, one thing I will add to that is we anticipate, so this bucket of funding that was available from Federal Highways for this program, this funding, um, they didn't they didn't release all of it in this recent community uh, and fuel and community charging and fueling infrastructure program. They've they've reserved some and set that aside. Likely we, we would see another similar opportunity in the future, whether that's next year or however. Um, so we anticipate if we weren't awarded any funding that there would be other opportunities to apply for funding. In the chat, we have Mary Brunner saying, since there are already two programs, Volkswagen, um, DC Fast Charger and Nevi that focus solely on corridors. I think that the CFI program should focus more on areas where there are charging deserts and or a high percentage of renters rather than proximity to a corridor. This is the only funding opportunity for many communities in NH. Nora states, 
or asks, excuse me, I'm interested to know whether there could be a way to provide low cost financing as a part of awards since this is a reimbursement opportunity and that can limit the applicants who can play the game. Was that, a, was that a question, Vanessa? I'm sorry, was she asking if there is? She said she's interested to know whether there could be a way to provide low-cost financing as a part of the awards. And that's an interesting question. It's something we would have to look into, but um, we'll definitely keep that in mind when we respond to the Q&A. There are some, um, some things we could look into there, potentially. No guarantees, but we'll certainly respond in the Q&A on that one. Ben Steele asked, do you picture spreading the grants funded throughout the state geographically or just using other criteria to select projects? To be determined. Like I said, we're, we still have not received this funding. We're looking to hear from you. If, if you think you've got something in mind that you think might work for us to be considering as we're potentially developing a funding opportunity, then please, uh, please tell us what your thoughts are on that. Brett Charrington said, how might a previous application for CMAC funds on the same community locations affect the funding in this Navi community program and vice versa? That's a good question and something we would probably want to take some time and respond to in that question and answer document that we plan to post on our website. Something we need to think about. Uh, let me jump in on that to just say that we are aware that the federal strings that are attached to the CMAC funds are sort of onerous and that has uh, caused a long delay in in CMAC projects that were approved by NHDOT but that are unable to go forward at this point because of, of uh, various uh, strings that are attached. So we are aware of that. Thanks, Becky. JJ Smith stated there might be a point in giving points, so I think in giving additional points um, when scoring to communities that would share use of V2G stations that could be charging trash trucks, buses, ambulance service, services overnight at low rates, and then be open all day um, charging public customers, he stated. Yes, vehicle to grid is an interesting technology that would allow uh, the vehicle's battery to charge overnight, perhaps when costs, when electrical costs, when electric uh, utility costs are lower, and then potentially feed back to the grid to kind of support that when costs are higher. Um, it's an interesting technology and something to certainly consider. Thank you. M. Frederick stated, would love to see NHDES and NHDOE, Department of Energy, pursue as much federal funding as possible for efficiency and energy infrastructure. I think it's something like 100 New Hampshire towns that now have an energy committees. So why voters might not say, so why voters might not say this is their number one issue. It's clearly a need and a desire in NH. Thank you, Harry, said Jessica. You and your team are doing an excellent job. Keep it up. Thank you. <laughs> ben Thank you. commented, I think it might make sense to spread out funding projects geographically or at least use it as one part of the criteria. And John L. Stating, stated, given that governmental support for innovations is normally taken over by a private capital, think of the internet. It is important to think how we can support an equitable rollout of EV use in an environmentally sound one. The patterns set early by government support can shape the future and inevitable commercial takeover. All right, um, we have Mark Byron raising his hand. Go ahead, Mark. Um, are you monitoring uh, what the private sector is doing uh, when it comes to level three charging? because there seems to be a bunch of initiatives for announced that they're gonna do their own network. Um, a bunch of other companies have. It, it makes it even more complicated, makes your job even more complicated because you don't know, you know, it's a bunch of balls in the air and you don't know where they're gonna fall out. 
but are you monitoring what the or, or do let's say put it in, do private sector tell the state hey we're going to put up this fast charger here or or do you find out when it gets posted on pubs here I guess I would say it's a combination of things. I mean, certainly in our mobile sources team, we have our Grant State Clean Cities program, which is supported by the US DOE, and, and we're tracking stations that open and even close around the state. Um, we certainly are tuned in to different news sources and different groups um, that do share, but there's no guarantee that we are going to always be aware of everything that's happening. We try to obviously create as much engagement opportunity as we can to find out about those um, so that that can inform any kind of planning that we might do when it comes to charging infrastructure. But um, there's no there's no guarantee that we're going to be alerted to that ahead of time. So we do keep our noses, you know, keep our, uh, you know, eyes on the on news and, and ever other announcements that are going on um, to try to keep track of all that. But thank you for sharing, Mark. We also have Bill with his hand raised. Bill Baber, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, some, doing some thinking about the, your first question, and I was just wondering if that might be another possibility to do something that's uh, somewhere between the, the uh, first and second option of having stage or having it um, end in February, was it? And that just set, set a single date, but publish your scoring at the same time you uh, open for applications and set a threshold that um, if people meet a certain threshold that they would be eligible for immediate approval um, and then that would still provide for equity for those that are coming in later uh, but uh, would might help accelerate um, applications and get um, you know your make ready profits uh, projects uh, out the door quicker thank you bill Appreciate that thoughtful comment. And just one thing I do want to clarify too is that those those dates are projected as you know as we think about. We're not sure when we would be notified of an award, and at that point in time, we would still have some work to do to develop a funding opportunity. So in terms of of how what those actual months or that timeline might be, very much up in the air. But that's something certainly to keep in mind. I appreciate your feedback on that. We have Doug Kogan in the chat stating, stating, I would like to see NH towns that have adopted community power agreements take up the mantle of community EV charging to support EV charging goals, especially in rural and Justice 40 communities. And Mary Brunner states, my last piece of feedback is please make the application process and grant administration as simple as you possibly can to encourage applications from smaller and more rural communities that don't have the staff who specialize in grant applications and administration. At this point, it doesn't look like we have any other feedback um, in the chat um, and no one's raising their hand. All right, we'll give everybody that three second opportunity any last comments or input we have brett raising his hand go ahead brett i think uh, you're brett. muted brett ah uh, there we go i have two mute switches sorry about that i think first i'm super excited that the state is investing in ev infrastructure i certainly believe like it is a barrier that if you cannot charge your vehicle or like put fuel in it you probably can't like hesitate about like driving it somewhere um separately just like this week a news story caught my eye that honda and gm abandoned their plans to develop a sub thirty thousand dollar ev and the average cost of an ev now in the in the u.s is about sixty two thousand dollars which skews to you know, in my mind, kind of luxury. And I'm wondering, you know, in parallel to the infrastructure investments that we're making, are funds available that will help, I don't subsidize purchases or leases or whatever in this environment? Because even if we get the infrastructure there, I 
it's a part of me that worries like are people going to actually be able to like is it viable for people to buy these vehicles and how do we make that happen certainly a good question and and as of right now um in new hampshire folks that purchase an ev may be eligible for either one of the ev tax credits that passed under the inflation reduction act or if they are a member of the new hampshire electric cooperative utility the utility does offer both um, private and commercial rebates for the purchase of an electric vehicle. But as of right now, those are the only two incentives that I'm aware of for, um, for, for, for folks that purchase an EV. So I appreciate your, your comment. All right, cool. Thank you very much. All right. So let's look at a little bit of the feedback we got from that form that we had posted. Folks were saying we should remain flexible as new advances are made to incentivize cost-effective destination charging. Level two is a cost-effective good fit. Glad to see DC fast charging is encouraged, but not required in this program. We should provide some technical support and assistance. Ensure that funded projects are dispersed throughout the state and regions, including rural versus urban settings. Renters, multifamily housing, and dense commercial areas need reliable level two. Prioritize the volume of drivers and accessibility of new and existing charging sites. Priority should be given to more rural, less developed locations. Private interests will first install charging stations where users congregate. We need safe, well-lit charging locations. And applicants should be scored on cost optimization and specifically cost per install versus project cost share. So a lot of those aligning with what we're hearing today. So let's talk about what happens next. So after both listing sessions, we have this one now that's closing at the top of the hour and we have one that will run from seven to nine. After this, we will consolidate comments received, post the recordings and the slide deck and post our responses on the New Hampshire DES website. So please be patient for that. As you've registered for this, we will be alerting you of that. We will consider the comments received and develop some programmatic standards. Hopefully we get funding. If we do, we'll publish a request for proposals. Sign up for our transportation infrastructure or NEVI mailing list to stay up to date. And, you, and if you contact us at msgrants at des.nh.gov, if you have any questions about the slide deck or this presentation or how to find out where to sign up for that transportation infrastructure mailing list, we're happy to be a resource to you all. And that's all I have. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.